Axis Church, happy Easter. That's right. Today is the day we celebrate. Today is the reason we are here. Today is the day our faith is made whole. We are so grateful for today. We are so grateful for the truth of the resurrection of Jesus and what that means for our life. And today we want to celebrate it. Today we want to honor it. And today and forevermore for the rest of our lives, we want to live it out. Church, won't you join us in prayer as we honor Jesus Christ today? Father, today is the day. Jesus, you resurrected. You did a miracle that just goes beyond comprehension. But you didn't just do it to show off. Or you didn't just do it to show how strong you are. You did it to redeem us. You did it in such an intentional way that you planned it from the start. Thank you, Lord, for tearing that veil, for allowing the opportunity of relationship with you. We want to pursue that this day. We want to seek your holy face this day. And we, we just want to bask in your presence, God. And just tell you that we love you. Tell you that we're thankful. And just be with you, Lord. Thank you for being enough in our lives. We love you, Jesus. And the church said, amen. Let's sing. Why don't we sing along to Jesus today? Sin was heavy, but chains break 
got the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan but you called me a citizen of heaven when I was broken you were my healing now you're
Father, we love you and we thank you for this beautiful Easter Sunday. Lord, thank you so much for what a beautiful reminder this morning is. That you came, set the example, died on the cross, and rose again. You have truly transformed our lives forever. And Lord, for that, we are grateful and we are thankful and we are excited this morning for what you're going to do. We love you, Lord. We ask all these things in your matchless and powerful name. Amen and amen. Well, welcome, Axis Church, Axis family. We just want to take a moment to say we miss you and we love you and happy Easter Sunday. We also want to take a moment to say welcome to anyone that's viewing us for the first time, all of those that are online, maybe viewing us from a different state, um, from home, wherever you are, we just want to say welcome. Thank you so much for choosing to do church with Axis Church this morning. We also want to take a moment to let you know of some amazing opportunities you have during the week to tune in to our online experiences. If you're interested in a Bible study for different ages, we've got stuff for kids, we've got stuff for youth, we've got stuff for young adults, we've got stuff for adults, whatever it is, check us out on our Facebook page and our Instagram page and you can get all that information. Well, this is the time in our service that we get to give our tithe and offering. That's right, I said it, we get to give. Why are we so excited here at Axis Church? Well, let me tell you why we're excited to give. Number one, we get to be obedient to God's word. I get to express my love and gratitude to my king by giving of my tithe and offering. Secondly, it's a heart check. The Lord wants to make sure that your hope and trust is not in your bare hands and what you're capable of doing, but he wants to make sure that your hope and trust is in him. So Axis family, 
There's three ways that you can give this morning. One, you can give online. Two, you can text to give. Or three, you can mail it in. Please pick whichever way is most convenient for you and your family. If you're visiting us or tuning in for the first time, understand that everything I just said about tithing is not for you. We want you to sit there and really enjoy our online experience. Unless between you and the Lord, you'd like to give, feel free to do so. Well, Axis family, those tuning in, get ready because the best is yet to come. And that's the word of God that has the potential to transform your life. Happy Easter and enjoy the service. Good morning, Axis family and Axis friends. We are Axis Church, where everything we do revolves around Jesus. Jesus is the center of it all, and this morning is Easter Sunday. And we are super excited, super stoked about the notion that Jesus Christ gave his life, was buried in a tomb, and rose just as he said he would. What a celebration that's going on in the hearts around people all over the world, knowing that the very God who was born as a baby in a manger, lived a life of perfection, went to the cross paying the, the penalty for my sins and the sins of humanity. That's what Easter is all about. The resurrection is what Christianity hinges on. If you, if you blow holes through the resurrection, then Christianity falls down like a house of cards. But because the greatest atheistic minds throughout 2,000 years have not been able to debunk or disprove the resurrection, we can sit back with surety in our hearts that our Savior lives. And it's not because the atheists can't prove it, but because Jesus has made it a reality to each and every one who believes in him. He has revealed himself, he has shown himself, and he adores you, he loves you, and he died for you. But he rose for you as well. And I want to encourage you today, as we gather this morning in living rooms or wherever it is that you are right now, all across America and all across the world, that we celebrate the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. My name is Anthony. I am the lead pastor here at Axis Church. I am so excited today that I got away from that little table that I was sitting at, and I brought out the big guns. I got the pulpit out for Easter Sunday, and if it's Easter Sunday, you got to have a crazy sock game going on, so you got to match a shirt and the socks. It's part of the package deal. Anyway, I want to welcome you here this morning to Axis Church. We are so grateful that you're tuning in and spending some time with us today. For those who are part of the Axis family, we love you, we miss you, and we're so glad that you're tuning in. And maybe you, some of you, this is the first time you've ever watched a service with Axis Church. I really, from the bottom of my heart, want to thank you for taking the time to tune in and check out what's going on in the circle of our uh, abilities to love on and cry out to and help the community that we serve in Medford, Patchogue, Port Jeff, and, and abroad. We are a family of believers that just love Jesus and want to live for him the way he died for us. He gave us his very best, and we want to do the same. So we are so grateful that you're here this morning. Thank you so much. If you want to know more about the church, we would love for you to email us at info at accessny.org. You should see that email address on the screen. That's info at accessny.org. With that said, I also want to remind everybody, since it is Easter and it is about celebration and joy, that there's still an effort being made to help the needs in our community due to the coronavirus. So if you check out our Facebook page, you'll see a list of things that are being dropped off so that we're able to meet the needs of people who have either lost their job, they're on the front lines serving, and they need help inside hospitals and medical wards. And we also have the uh, opportunity to give people who are dealing with the virus some uh, necessities like non-perishable food, toilet paper, paper towels, et cetera. And we're, we're doing a kind of drop-off system where we're bringing things to them. But we still need things. So if you can please check out our website, find out the next drop-off days, we would greatly appreciate it. And I should say Facebook page, not website. With that said... I want to preach the gospel to you guys this morning. It is a beautiful, beautiful opportunity. Hearts, I know, are supple and open to hearing the truth about Jesus Christ. And what I want to do this Easter morning is focus on two people that were a little down 
it was Easter morning and they were kind of they were kind of down. Now a lot of the disciples were as well, and, and the reports were starting to come back that he's alive. He's alive. But there was a couple of guys that they just didn't they didn't know. They didn't buy into it yet. And I want to talk about these two disciples that were walking on what's known as the road to Emmaus. So you can find this in Luke chapter 24, and I'm going to begin from verse 13. It says, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood there, their faces downcast. One of them, named Clopas, asked him, Are you the only one living in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what more... It is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Now, the story goes on. I encourage you to continue, you know, have the opportunity to read it later today in Luke 24. And these disciples, they're walking. Jesus is right there with them, and they're having this conversation. And I'm going to break down some of the things that happened, their interaction between them, and notice how it can be applicable for us today to see that maybe we can be a lot like them as well. So the first thing we looked at is it says Jesus came, uh, came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now, it could very well just be that supernaturally, Jesus in that glorified body, that risen you know, body of his now, he has the ability as God to just keep them from noticing what was right in front of them. But I also believe that there are things in the natural realm that at times cause us to not be able to recognize Jesus and he's standing there right in front of us. There are moments in life, sometimes they're difficult times, sometimes they're sinful times, and we could have Jesus right there and we don't even notice it. The case in point was earlier that morning, Easter morning, Mary was in the garden. And when she got to the tomb, she was looking for Jesus' body and it, it was gone. And she came out and she saw a man and she started saying, Sir, do you know where his body is? And she thought he was the gardener. And he starts talking with her and she says, No, please tell me. And he says, Mary. And she looks and she notices Jesus. Well, what might have caused Mary to not notice him standing there in the first place? Well, her grief. Trust me, there's a lot of times when we have grief in our life, and there are some people right now who have been going through quite a struggle with the coronavirus, and they've lost loved ones, and their grief right now might be the very thing that keeps them from seeing a loving, caring God because they can't understand why this has been allowed to happen. And I understand that. But in, in no uncertain terms should we ever allow grief to cloud our, our eyes so much that we can't see the God who still loves us and cares about us and is standing right there next to us. If we choose to sin, well, Jesus can be there, and I pray that we get convicted, but sometimes we get so caught up in sin that we have to leave Jesus at home. And we, can't, we can't, you know, go out and, and be the type of people, not that many people are going out right now, but we can't do things that are unbecoming of the Lord and ask him to come and hang out with us. We're either serving him or we're not. But there's multiple things in our lifetime that will cause us to miss Jesus, and he's right there standing in front of us. Sometimes it's just being preoccupied with life and doing things the way we want to do them, raising kids and taking care of all the things that life throws at us. We get so preoccupied with doing life that we forget about the one who gives life. And he says these words to them as they're walking down the road to Emmaus, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Now, here's the funny thing about Jesus. You know, when God asks a question to people, he already knows the answer. It's not like he's confused. You know, when Satan visited God in the heavenly realm in the book of Job, he says, if you consider my servant Job, there's none like him. Well, he knew the answer to that already. When he, he spoke to Adam and he says, Adam, where are you in the Garden of Eden? When God said those words, he knew where Adam was. 
Adam was the one who was a bit confused at the time. When he spoke to the blind man, when Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, I want to see. Well, Jesus knew that he wanted to see. But those questions are probing questions to get us to look inside of ourselves so that we would recognize what we are facing in the moment and what we need to bring to God. You see, with Adam, when God said, where are you? He was making Adam realize without no uncertain terms that Adam was not in the place he was supposed to be. And that's probably a question many of us need to answer this Easter morning. Are we where we're supposed to be? And I'm not talking about the location you're in. I'm talking about spiritually, not geographical, but spiritually. Where are you with Jesus? He died for you. He rose for you. But will you be able to receive this gift of eternal life? Have you repented of your sins? Have you recognized that we're guilty in our sins and we need to repent and turn to him to be considered innocent in the eyes of God? The sacrifice of Jesus was done for us so that we can live. We can't earn our way to heaven. We can't be good enough to get there. We can't give money to a charitable organization. We can't do humanitarian outreach enough to make God happy with us. Look, he loves you. He's already chose to do that. You can't be uh, behaved better to get him to love you more, and you can't behave worse to get him to love you less. His love is consistent. But where are you? That's a question God is going to ask every one of us. And if we're not right with him, then we're not in a good place. When he spoke to the, the blind man, when Jesus said those words, the blind man was acknowledging his need. You know, he, he recognized that he needed to see. So there are times when God is trying to challenge our hearts, and there's times when God is recognizing our needs, but he asks questions to get us to be able to evaluate the situation that we're in and whether or not we're letting God come into that moment to be able to change this scenario. It said that they stood still with their faces downcast. Now, here was the thing. I already read to you. They said the reports were coming back. He's not in the tomb. He's gone. He's, he's risen. And the thing that, that may, maybe bothers me is that Jesus was saying these words. Now, I am human. And if at that moment I experienced something that confused me and I didn't get it, then I probably would be acting just like these two disciples. But let's remember that Jesus told them on multiple occasions that he was going to be he was going to be brought to trial, he was going to be killed, and he was going to come back on the third day. He spoke these words of life to them, but instead of allowing themselves to remember those words, they seem to be thinking more in a, in a different way. They're thinking more in, a, in, a, in a, an emotional situation. When people heard Jesus speak, the Bible says that they hung on every word, that they, everything that Jesus said they held on to. And it's at these moments when we're having a rough time that we need to hold on to his words even more and not let the emotional part of what we're dealing with take over, but rather let's believe his word for what he says. And they turned around, and it's almost like sarcastically, they say, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened here? It's like, what do you, you, what do you been under a rock, you know? And, and they're saying this to Jesus. It's like someone right now saying, why isn't anybody going out? How come nobody's in the stores? Why are all the streets empty? How come no one's in church? And we would say, what have you, like, you haven't been in, like, the world lately? Have you just, you know, come back from the moon or something? Because everybody knows about the virus, and everybody knows about, you know, flattening the curve and social distancing and all that stuff. And that's what they're saying to Jesus, because that was the story of the day that he was crucified. Everyone in Jerusalem was talking about it, from Rome to the Jewish community and everybody there. It was Passover, just the, the, the night before Jesus was crucified. So that means that there was hundreds of thousands of people gathering around that city. And he was the biggest story. And they go and they start telling him their version of what went down. They start telling him how they saw things, but they didn't complete it. And that's the thing. There, there's times when we think we know all the answers, and we can have a story that seems to be kind of complete. But even if we leave just a little bit off, it can change the entire story altogether. See, Jesus had the ending of the story, and he wanted to give it to them. He wanted to see that it doesn't end with just an empty tomb and no explanation. It ends with the God who came back from the dead and is able to 
show himself to his disciples and show himself to many others and even some 500 at one time. And he showed them the nail scars in his hands and his side. Even for Thomas, who's the last one to finally have the glimpse of Jesus out of all the disciples. And he says, go ahead, stick your finger in the side. Check out my hands. See the scars. It's me. And Thomas falls down and he says, my God and my Savior. It's really true that Jesus is the one who is the final word. And we need to let him have the end of the story. Whenever it is that we are looking at, whatever it is that we're going through, let Jesus be the one who completes the story and brings that that story to the place where he wants it to go. You might have a lot of truth, but you want to make sure that it's complete. And when it's in him, the completion always points to the cross. He says, how foolish you are and how slow you are to believe all the prophets have spoken. And he says, you know, you're listening to your emotions. You might even be listening to what other people are saying. What about listening to the word of God? And friends, that is the quintessential factor that differentiates a true follower of Christ and somebody who maybe, you know, gets blown around by the wind and, and, and just, he's one day solid, one day isn't. That's called a lukewarm believer, if that. And the Bible says that he'll spit us out of his mouth if we're lukewarm. He'd rather us be hot or cold for him, you know. So when we look at this, I, I think about the past, uh, uh, a phrase, a quote that somebody uh, I, I highly respect had once said. He said, the only scriptures you believe are the ones you obey. And that's powerful to me because I can say that I believe the Bible, but if I don't do what it says, then I'm not really obeying it. I'm not really believing it because if I really have stock in it, I'm going to do it. It's like being married. When I made my vow to my wife, I committed to her being the only woman in my life. I committed to being with her for sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer, uh, you know, uh, for better or for worse. As long as we both shall live, I have to back that up. I could have said those words one day and then went out and lived any life I wanted. And that would have broken her heart and that would have caused her to recognize that this was not a marriage. It was a mistake. We can't play games with God. Either we know his word and we follow him, or we don't. And Jesus is looking at them and saying, why are you being so foolish? And he starts to break down. It says, from the beginning, from Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what the the scriptures said concerning himself. In other words, from Genesis to Revelation, there's 66 books in the Bible, 39 Old Testament, 27 New. In all of those books, Jesus is able to be seen. You're able to see the Christological implications in the Old Testament. And you get to see Jesus alive in the New Testament. It's said this way. The Old Testament conceals Jesus. The New Testament reveals what the Old Testament was saying. So we see that coming to life of the entire Bible, and Jesus did that for them. He broke down what Moses and the prophets said, and as he's speaking to them, they're starting to get it. They're start, he's bringing it to completion. He's drawing all those paths right to himself so that they would know and believe. And it says when he was with them at the table, they, they talk him into going home with them. And, and now they're hanging. It was a very different day, like some stranger walking on the road. You talk to him, hey, come on in, you know, very different time. But he goes into the house with them, and he sits with them, and then they have, like, supper. You know, they have, like, communion. And he holds up the bread, and he breaks it, and he gives thanks. And all of a sudden, something changes. It says, when he was at the table with them, he broke bread, gave thanks, and he began to give it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And that's really what Easter has to be for us. Easter has to be the moment when our eyes were opened. When we finally saw Jesus for who he said he is. The book of Job, I alluded to it before. He was a godly man and he loved the Lord. He went through some horrific trials Satan perpetrated it. God understood it was going to happen and allowed it to take place. And there's meaning and reason behind all of it. I'm not here to talk about Job. I'm here to talk about what happened to him in Job chapter 42. He said, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen. And it changed Job's perspective of all the suffering that he was going through. We, too, need to have a personal revelation of Jesus. I hope you pray this prayer. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, Lord, 
Reveal yourself to me. Lord, I want to know you. If you're real, show me who you are. And I believe that his word brings faith by hearing it. I believe his word brings conviction by listening to it. And I'm praying that you today, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, would recognize that Easter doesn't have to be another holiday. Easter can be the day that you saw with your own eyes. You had your own revelation of Jesus that he truly has died and rose again so that your sins, as well as mine, can be washed away and forgiven. The Bible says unless we're born again, we can't even see the kingdom of God. Now let me clarify that phrase. Too many people think the, word, the phrase born again is a bunch of crazy people who are doing some crazy things. And I would say that there are some crazy people who are born again. That's true. But there are some crazy people who are not born again, and you know them as well. They're just, you know, they don't even go to church. They're just crazy. The bottom line is this. Being born again is not about getting a 10% discount card at Target and wearing a jacket that says the born agains. Being born again means that you have now had surrendered your heart to Jesus recognized your need for him as your savior and he makes you a new person and you start to see that his word is valuable you start to see that his teachings are 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 life-giving and you want to honor him with your life and live for him the way he died for you with everything that he had in him that's what really being born again is about it's it's about living a life for jesus So I'm not ashamed to say I'm born again, but I think the mindset of many people uh, of what that means has been kind of uh, convoluted and and mixed in with a bunch of other things based on some behavior patterns that some people have observed. And I'm trying to just make it clear to you, Jesus himself said, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. So if you want to see Jesus with your eyes, you're going to have to surrender your heart and, 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 and hand your life over to the Lord, and you will truly get a good look at who he really is. They said, at that moment, Jesus just disappears from them. It's, it's kind of amazing, the supernatural things that Jesus was doing in his glorified body now that he's risen from the grave. And it says, were not our hearts burning within us when he spoke the word to us? And the true test of our being affected by the empty tomb is not what happens on the outside, You know, Easter morning, many people up to this year (laughs) would put on their Sunday best, you know, and they would go to church and they would look really nice and the kids would be all dressed up and it would be a a very special day for the majority of the communities, especially here in America, where they would go to church that day. We would see astronomical numbers on an Easter Sunday for sure. But what I'm saying is that this burning of the heart was happening on the inside. It had nothing to do with the outside yet. Because what happens on the inside inevitably should change the things that happen on the outside. Sometimes the way we look, but usually the way we behave, the way we respond, the way we act. Those those things that we do, when our heart is right with God, start to look very different to the people around us. When they find humility out of someone who is filled with pride. When they see modesty out of someone who maybe wasn't very modest when they start to see people putting others before themselves when they were truly selfish. Man, you start to see that Jesus is doing something on the inside of that person. And that's what Christianity is, that when we surrender our heart, then he has the ability to change our heart. And we start to value the things, as John, 1 John 2, 3 says, we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commands. John goes on and says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Now, you might say, well, how could I live like Jesus? No, we're not talking about perfection. He was perfect. We can't be. But what we are talking about here is that Jesus wants to, as we surrender to him, clean us up. I want to finish with a little story about my dad, and then the worship team is going to come back and lead you in a special chorus as we finish out this Easter morning celebration. Growing up, I was living in Brentwood. My dad would commute to the city. He was a, a city sanitation worker. My friends called him a garbage man. I called him an environmental engineer. It just sounded better, right? Well, he would go into the city, and I remember one time he took me. I I maybe was seven, eight years old, and I was with him on the job. And he was, you know, he was collecting trash. He was throwing out the garbage. And I was just watching. He would either be driving, and I'd be sitting next to him, 
or he would let his uh, other partner drive, and he would go, and he would pick up the pails and throw them in the back of the hopper. And he would, you know, that was his job, and I would just hang out with him. My, the highlight of it was going to McDonald's when it was all over as a kid. That was huge. But one thing I did notice, my takeaway from that lesson as a little kid, was that my father, his partner, or any of the guys that worked in city sanitation, there was a stipulation for them to throw out your garbage. You had to bring the garbage to the curb for them to be able to take it and throw it away for you. They didn't go in anyone's house, empty out the garbage pail in the kitchen, put it, you know, grab the bag, run out. No, it had to be at the curb for them to throw out the garbage. He was a sanitation worker. Years later, about a decade or more, I realized that I needed Jesus as my Savior. I was living life my way. And I had that eye-opening experience. Something changed in my heart. And I recognized the parallel between my earthly father, who was a sanitation worker, and my heavenly father, who was what's known as a sanctification worker. And what sanctification means is that God wants to clean us up. But the same stipulation applies. If I am going to let God clean me up, then it's my responsibility to give him the garbage in my life. Whatever that might look like for you, you have to give him the garbage in your life. Because if you don't give it over to him, there's a word for that. It's called hoarding. And I don't know if you've ever watched those shows about people who hoard, but they don't think they have a problem. Their house is filled with clutter and things are, it's hard to navigate and you can't get around. And when, nobody wants to go in that house. It's, it's scary. You don't know what's living in the piles of garbage that are there. And it also has a stink to it. And I want you to realize this, that if you choose not to give God your garbage, there's going to be people around you that notice the clutter of your life and also notice the stench of the sin. And they're going to see it. And you could deny it all you want, but it's obvious. And I'm recommending to you that if God is longing to clean you up, that obeying his word is the steps we start taking. And the more that we honor him by honoring his word, the more we're allowing him to sanctify us and clean us up. So you could give God your garbage. You could give him the issues of your life. You could give him all types of pain, hurts, hang-ups, and all the things that we have maybe had us holding us back from being who Christ wants us to be. It's Easter morning. He loves you with an everlasting love. Don't let another Easter come and go without the opportunity for you to know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. What does that mean? Well, the Bible says that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that there's, uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So we can live life on our terms and do it our way, but that will separate us from God. But if we live life his way and surrender to him, he says he'll give us everlasting life. Look, we've all done things to break God's word. We've lied, we've stolen things, we've disrespected our parents, we've dishonored God, we've had other gods before him, even if we become our own God. We've used his name in vain, we've, we've, you know, we've not honored the Sabbath and kept it holy. We've done all that, we've broken the commandments, and we're guilty. But God wants to turn us from guilty to innocent. That's why Jesus came. There was a payment that had to be paid in order for sin to be removed. That's what the cross is all about. Jesus came. No one else is coming. But Jesus rose from the grave. So now he has the authority to forgive the sins of those who repent. If you want to know Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you to email me personally, anthony at axisny.org. And I would love to have an opportunity. Either we'll call, call you, I'll call you on the phone, we'll talk, or we'll email back and forth the opportunity to speak about Jesus and whatever questions you might have, like I began, questions get asked so that we can look deep inside of ourselves. Whatever I can do to help you on this journey, it would be my absolute honor because I hope and pray that everyone who's watching here repents, turns to the Lord, and knows God. Either you have already or you will because God's heart is that none should perish but all come to repentance. I love you so much. Have an amazing Sunday. At this time, our worship team is going to come back, and they're going to lead us in a beautiful, traditional chorus that I believe is going to bless your soul. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow.
The Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to Stay.